That's the signal I've been waiting for. Guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Es freut mich sehr, Sie alle hier zu sehen. Aber ich glaube, niemand hier versteht Deutsch noch. So I better switch to English, or Frau Bremen will have my head on a platter like St. John the Baptist himself. Several years ago, they redid the interior of my house in Trap. And all, everything was changed, and rooms trained, changed names and function and so forth. They did a marvelous job. And we had an open house for the community. And one of the groups came through, was fascinated by my office. And they all left and moved on to the next room. But one man stayed, and he's looking very carefully around the office. Now that everybody is gone, he can spend more time and examine more closely what was there. And he saw books that were in Greek, Latin, Hebrew, German, English, and French. And he looked at me with his head tilted this way, and he said, how did you get to be so smart? And I said to him, well, the Lord gave me a brain that worked, and I tried to use it in his service all my life long. I also had the great good fortune to attend Göttingen University, where I studied theology. And then I went to the University of Halle, which was the place that missionaries would go to to be prepared to minister in foreign countries. And they taught you everything, the basics there, including uh, basic medicine, uh, medical care of people. So I was in Halle, walking around the campus, and a young man ran up to me and said, uh, Herr Mühlenberg, uh, Dr. Franke wants to speak to you. Now, he was the president of the university. I thought, now, what does he want? What kind of trouble am I in now? I went to his office, and he said, Mirror back, we have a problem that we think you might be able to help us with. We know that you have your heart set to go to India as a missionary. But we have three congregations in Pennsylvania they're already organized, and they have been petitioning us for a pastor for three years. And we have been unable to find anybody that is willing to go to Pennsylvania and work with these people. And if we don't send them a pastor soon, these congregations are going to fall away. They will simply disband or go, God forbid, to the Presbyterians. So, something has to be done. We want you to consider this call to go to Pennsylvania, three congregations, one salary. I said, well, do I have some time to think about this? Have some time to pray about this? Sure, take all the time you want, he said. But let me know by tomorrow what you're going to do. Okay. I thought about it. And then I thought, well, you know, I have to learn English either way. If I go to India, I have to learn English. If I go to Pennsylvania, which is a British territory, I have to learn English there too. I went back the next day. I said, I'll give it a try. Good, said Franke. We will take care of you. You go to London next, and Siegenhagen will arrange your passage to North America. He will get you a tutor and teach you English. He'll take care of all the necessities, all the financial uh, details he will handle. The next thing I knew, I was on board a ship headed towards North America. That was quite a trial. Across the Atlantic in those days took three months. The food was terrible. The water became putrid. 
you had to listen to the sailors cursing. And I went up and complained about their language, especially since there were women and children on board. They should not use such rough language in front of them. But they paid me no attention whatsoever. What do you do when the water gets bad and you can't drink it by itself? We had to make coffee out of it to get it down and keep it down. What do you do when you run out of that and you have no water left? You spread blankets out on the decks, and when it rains, you wring the blankets out into barrels, and you drink that. And what happens when you run out of that? You die. We had almost made it across the Atlantic to South Carolina, the city of Charleston, and the wind was against us, and we couldn't get to land, and we ran out of water. And any of you that have been to Charleston know it is a hot, humid place and you're drinking constantly because of the climate. Now, our captain wasn't as dumb as he looked. He's scanning the ocean, how off in the distance we could see the land. And there was a British man of war what was a British man of war doing there off the coast of Carolina? It was protecting the coast from raids by galleons that were patrolling off the coast of Florida, doing the same thing. That was a Spanish territory at that time. So they were constantly guarding the coast from each other. The man of war demanded that we identify ourselves, and the captain declined to do so. And right away, the man of war headed toward us, and finally got to us and declared again, who are you? What nation are you from? And we ran up the English colors. Why didn't you tell us sooner? Because we needed you to get here as quickly as possible. We are out of water, and if we don't get water on board here immediately, people will begin to die. Brought the water on, the wind changed, and into the port of Charleston we went. I did not like Charleston. Charleston, to me, was a very unpleasant place because of the issue of slavery. There were, it was told to me later, 15 black slaves to every white man. And we were not allowed to evangelize those slaves. So those poor people didn't even have the comfort of the gospel to support them in their position of servitude. Well, the plan was to take a sloop, which were the little ships that ran up and down the coast. There were no highways at that time, of course. And I was distressed to find out that the last one before the winter break was leaving in two or three days. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was get on board another ship, having been on one for three months. This was very, very difficult decision for me to make. But if I did not get on that sloop, then I would have to wait in Charleston for three months and I didn't want to do that. So I made arrangements to get on board the sloop, and it was three weeks, three months to get across the Atlantic, three weeks to get to Charleston, from Charleston to Philadelphia. I endured it. It was nothing but seasickness, up and down, lousy food, lousy water again, until I got to Philadelphia. Well, finally, I reached the promised land, so to speak. And I disembarked, and I listened carefully for the first person that I heard speaking German. There were a lot of German speakers in Philadelphia at that time. I went up to the man and I said, can you put me in touch with the leadership of St. Michael's Lutheran Church? Oh, Herr Pastor, we've been waiting for you. Yes, we can do that. We'll take you right away and introduce you to the deacons. They did that. I had my credentials, and one or two of them recognized a couple of the signatures. 
that showed that I was the genuine thing. I was not a jack like preacher. I was the man that they had sent from Hala, the uh, Hala Fathers had sent me there. That's what we call them, the Hala Fathers. Okay, they said, now, we know that you're not just going to be taking care of us, you're also going to be going to Providence, and there, we will take you to Providence and introduce you to the leadership there. Now, that is today known as TRAP. They took me up there, and I looked around. No church. They were worshiping in the barn of one of the deacons. There were four languages that were spoken in that barn. German, horse, pig, and cow. And everybody got along well. They had no church building, but they said, now that you are here, we will build a church. So I walked around, and at one point on the property was a big pile of rocks. I said, what's that big pile of rocks doing over there? That is the beginning of the building materials for our new church, which now you will be responsible for, to engage an architect. You know what a church should look like. We're waiting for you to help us with this. You know how to negotiate with people, with the builders and so on. You are a skilled man. You are an educated man. You know how to do these things. I was very, very pleased with this information. How do I get in touch with New Hanover? We will take you to the leadership in New Hanover. And the next day, they took me up there. They had a church, if you want to call it that. It was a ramshackle building made of a couple of boards and a roof slapped together to keep the rain off and the wind off in the winter time. And they said, now don't get scared, Pastor. When you see this building, we know this is not a satisfactory church, but we will build a new church. When you get here and can supervise all of the workers and all the plans that need to be made, we will build a new church. I said to them at the time, you know, this whole church is not so bad. We don't need to make this our first priority. Our first priority should be to build a schoolhouse. We need to think of the education of our children. There was no public school system, of course. Any education that the children got was from parish schools. Let us build a schoolhouse first, preferably large enough, that could accommodate also a schoolmaster, have a place for him to live, and then a schoolroom where the children would be taught. That's what we did there. But, of course, Philadelphia was the biggest church, and we had to build a church there. We even had to buy ground there. And the people were always getting in one another's hair. I did a lot of refereeing in Philadelphia. But uh, it grew very quickly, way beyond my control. I, I could not tend to so many people by myself in Philadelphia. So I petitioned the Hall of Fathers for another pastor to come and help me. And ultimately, they sent me a man by the name of Hanchu, Pastor Hanchu which means glove. And he did not look like a well man to me. So I said, Hanshu, let's be realistic here. You are not a countryman. You don't, you don't look to me like you would enjoy riding horseback from place to place, from church to church. How about I take the two country churches and you take the city church? Okay, he said, I think that would be great. What did I do? In the beginning, I had a room at each congregation. One of the parishioners would let me live in a room there. All right, that's okay for a week or two, but that gets old mighty fast. Children running around, and I have business to take care of, and counseling to do, and sermons to write. I can't do that with kids are screaming and carrying on running around the house. No, I have to have a place of my own. 
I need to have a home base. I chose Providence to be the place where this home would be built. Okay, they started working on this parsonage. And I could see it going up before my eyes. And I thought to myself, now I have a home, but who's going to take care of it? I'll hire an old woman to take care of the house, clean the house, cook, and so on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Heinrich. Not too fast now. You know old women, they get sick. What if this woman gets sick shortly after you hire her? You wouldn't be able to put her out on the street. You cannot fire a sick woman in a pietistic parish. They would not put up with this. Well, then I'll hire a young woman to come in and keep house. Young women don't get sick. And they can clean the house and, and cook the food and so forth. Oh, 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 wait a minute, Henry. No, that is not a good idea. You just said to yourself, that these people are pietists. They would never permit you to live in the same house with a young woman without being married to her. I had no intention of marrying. How am I going to get married with three congregations to take care of? Yeah, I guess I'll have to figure it out. So I put out the word that I was open to the idea of marriage. And the dinner invitations came flowing in. Oh, Pastor, we have the perfect daughter that would make the wonderful pastor's wife come to dinner on Saturday night. And so it went. And they all were wonderful young women, beautiful one, women who were skilled and could do anything. How does one make a choice? I had no experience in socializing with women. I didn't know what to do. And while I'm thinking about this, I was invited to the home of Conrad Weiser, and his daughter was Anna Maria. She was there, I saw her. I think I was about 10, 11 years older than she was. I liked that. I liked what I saw about her. She was devout, and she was meek. And I thought, maybe this, is, maybe this is the one. Things went well during that dinner. And as the evening drew to a close, I got up to leave, and Conrad Weiser came over to me, and he said, Herr Pastor, I want to tell you something before you leave. I said, what is that? He said, when my Anna Maria goes to be married, I am sending with her a dowry of 1,000 pounds. When I heard that, I fell deeply in love with Anna Maria, and I married her as quickly as I could. And we did very well together. We had 11 children, eight of whom survived, which in the 18th century was not a bad record at all. We made our home there, but we still had to spend a lot of time in Philadelphia because Hanchu died. He didn't last very long. And they were always getting in each other's hair. They were always getting in fights and arguments and complaints. So I had to spend a lot of time there to keep the place from self-destruction. Let me give you an example of what I am referring to. The church council at that time thought in the old way, as if they were still in a German-speaking region of Europe. There were people in the congregation that started yammering about bells. They wanted bells, like the English church. They wanted bells, too. And this rumor came to the Honorable Council, and they said, no, we can't do that. It's not the budget. 
but that didn't solve the problem. The complaints continued. We want bells. So the councilman came to me and said, what are we going to do about this? And they're yammering for bells. You know we don't have any money for bells. The budget is not big enough to include this. So, what do you want me to do about it? I said to the council. They said, well, you just stand up in the pulpit and you say, no, we're not going to get bells because we can't afford them. It's not in the budget, period. And then you sit down and that'll take care of it. I said, where do you think you are? You're not back in Stuttgart or Karlsruhe now. You're in Philadelphia. People don't think that way in Philadelphia. Back in the old country, all important decisions were made for you. You didn't have to decide anything. Everything was de decided by somebody else. But here, the people have input, and they can make their will known. And you must pay attention. I said, I propose the following. Let's see what we can find out. Vincent Bigler, you go down to the Bell Foundry in Philly and see how much it would cost to cast three bells right here in Philadelphia. Schmidt, you go to a reputable carpenter and you find out from him what adjustments would be needed on our building. Could we put a steeple? Would the building hold the weight Find weight of steeple and bells. Bring that information back. See how much this actually costs. And then we will put it up to the people. We will provide them the necessary information for them to make the decision whether we get bells or not. What we'll do is we'll put a book out here and we'll say, let's just say it's going to cost 800 pounds to buy the bell, to have the bells cast and have the steeple built or alterations made to the building to erect the bells. They brought that information back and then we have the people sign a book and how much they're willing to give over and above or contributions that they already make to the sustenance of the church. And we will have the book open with people taking turns from the Honorable Council to sit there and make sure everybody understands what they are doing, because many of them can't read or write, and we will help them make a signature. And at the end of three days, we'll add up all the numbers. And if the numbers come up to the proposed 800, the project will proceed. And if it doesn't, the project fails. This way, the people make the decision. If they want bells, they're going to have to give them some extra money because as you told me, it's not in the budget. We will vote on this procedure. We're not just going to say, now this is how we decide. We're going to have everybody buy into it. So this coming Sunday, we'll take a vote. Is this what you want to do, people? If so, vote yes today. If you're not interested in bells at all, vote no. And they overwhelmingly voted yes. Now you might say to me, well, Pastor Muhlenberg, what's so important about bells? Why must we have bells? They're not vital to the faith in any way. But they were to the people. The people saw that the community valued the English bells because the bells were rung when somebody died. And they were rung at other times too to call people to worship. But the bells being rung at death at a funeral was a part of our cultural heritage which was not being followed in Philadelphia. And our people wanted to have the clergy realize that they had as much value as any Englishman. So if they would ring bells when an Englishman died, they wanted bells to be rung when a German speaker died as well. They consider themselves every bit as important to the community as English speakers, and they were, because German people could do anything. 
They could cook. They could make stuff. They were carpenters. They were blacksmiths. And most important of all, they were farmers. They knew how to produce food. Everybody voted yes for that strategy. And the bells were ordered. No, we couldn't put them on the church. We had to put them on the schoolhouse. That schoolhouse was built strong and they could, uh, it would work there. But it didn't, uh, the church was, was not strong enough to bear the weight of three bells. And we got our bells. Now, a related problem that uh, I was fascinated by one of the members of the Honorable Council came up to me and said, do you know the Oschlagers are not coming to our church anymore? They're going to the English church. I said, well, we had a disagreement. He didn't like something that I said to him, so I guess he decided that he's going to go to the English church instead of coming here. Well, that's not right. The German church is for the Germans, and the English church is for the English. I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? Well, you stand up in the pulpit and you say it is forbidden for German speakers to go to the English church. I said, you've forgotten again where you are. You're in Philadelphia. You're not in Karlsruhe. You're not in Stuttgart. We have no say whatsoever where people go to church in this city, in case you didn't realize that. You have to be nice to people in Philadelphia when they come to church. You just can't ignore them as if it's a state church back in the old country. No, that doesn't work here. So, we struggled with that. And then I said, but if they leave us, we don't have to bury them in our cemetery. And we don't have to ring the bells when they die if they leave our church. Oh, that made them happy to know at least we could, could do that. What did I do every day? I did every day what every pastor does. I prepared to preach. I taught children their catechism. I baptized. I married people. I consulted with people about personal problems. I even translated English communications which are people either they couldn't read or they couldn't understand English I made them understand what communications were available uh, that would have been done by the average pastor even in Allentown but there were other things that I had to do because of the location and because of the times and the situation of our people that are no longer here. Many of our people started life in this country as indentured servants. They had to work for seven years, mostly for English speakers, who had been here before us and had a chance to get their economic act together. Well, after serving and living with English speakers for seven years, many of our people forgot how to speak their own language. And what if a German-speaking young man is interested in a formerly German-speaking young lady, but now she forgot her German? How are they going to communicate? How are they going to get together? This will be difficult. They had to learn German again. I had to teach them not only so they could uh, mingle socially, but also so that they could read the catechism and learn the catechism. That had to be read and learned in German. Well, why couldn't we have an English translation that some of these people could use? It would be so much easier, and I petitioned the Hala Fathers to give us permission to either make a translation or to send us a translation 
that we could use. My petition was denied. I don't know why. They were holy men. I never criticized the Hala Fathers. They were wonderful, spirit-filled men. But this I did not agree with. I also petitioned that we be able to start a seminary. They also said no to that. They would not do that either. They also said they didn't have any more helpers. Once in a while, we would get a new pastor. And we found plenty for them to do. Our system was that we had deacons lead the worship services and read sermons that were approved theologically by the authorities in Germany. They were called Postilen, and there was a sermon written for every Sunday in the liturgical year. But they were not able to celebrate communion, so what few clergy we had had to be shared, and they would constantly be moving from church to church to celebrate communion. There was another thing that uh, we did that was an accommodation to the situation. We didn't have enough clergy to hear private confessions. That was what we did in Europe, but that was simply not possible with the, the numbers that we had to deal with here in the New World. So we set up something called preparatory service. And that was when people would go to church on Saturday afternoon. It was a service of corporate confession. Everybody confessed corporately. I tried to get them to tell on one another special things that they had done that needed to be corrected in their lives. And they said, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. We have enough trouble handling our own sins, let alone the sins of others. And I backed off of that. So we made out the best way that we could. Uh, preparatory service would have to satisfy. That was the best that we could do. You might be interested in hearing about the language problem, because in Pennsylvania, we had a lot of fights between congregations and splits off of congregations because of people either wanting to remain all German speaking in the congregation, all their business, all the teaching, all the worship, all the singing, or um, some of them split off because they wanted English right away and they couldn't wait for us to change. At Trap, we changed quickly. And it came about this way. We became a bilingual parish rather rapidly. There was no bridge over the Perkiomen at that time. So if you wanted to get over the Perkiomen to come from the other side where the English church was, to us, you had to wait for the water to get low enough for a horse to cross or for you to come across on foot if you didn't own a horse. Well, one day, the Perkyoman was high, and our service began, and I happened to notice that there were a couple of English speakers in our service attending that day. And when the service was over, I went up to them and said, now, I'm, I'm curious, you're welcome here, of course, but why would you come to a service where you didn't understand anything that was going on? because you don't speak German. And they said, well, we could not get to our own church today because we couldn't get across the river. So we decided we would come here, that hearing a German service was better than nothing. And we enjoyed ourselves, even though we didn't understand anything. Still, we enjoyed it. We were in church. Okay, I said, that makes good sense to me. You come here any time you want when the river is high and you can't get to your own church. Well, it wasn't too long. 
the river was down at a level where they could have gone across to the English church if they wanted to go there, but they came to us. Did the same thing after the service. I said, now, I'm a little curious. You know you're always welcome here. But the river was low enough that you could get to your own church today if you wanted to. Why did you come here where you didn't understand anything? The answer was, we liked your singing. And they kept coming. And one day, one of them had the nerve to come up to me and say, Pastor, would it be possible once in a while to sing an English hymn? I said, I never thought of that. That's a good idea. Yes, we can do that. And I started to include some English hymns. Came up to me again a couple weeks later. Pastor, you know, even though we don't understand German, we do love the Word of God. Would it be possible to have an English message, just a little English message squeezed in here or there somewhere? I said, I never thought of that. That's a wonderful idea. Yes, we can do that. And that's how we ended up with a German service in the morning and an English service in the afternoon. More co our congregation should have followed our example at Augustus, and they wouldn't have had these fights over whether to speak German or speak English in the worship life of the church. But we made a transition to a bilingual parish, which then was congruent with the town. The town was a bilingual town. You spoke German, or you spoke English, or you spoke lousy German, you spoke lousy English, whatever business you needed, everybody was used to getting along somehow or other in somebody else's language. And the town prospered. Now, every now and then something happens that is not of major significance, but is of interest and how people operate and what you see happening around you. We had a rule in our congregation at Augustus that you did not receive communion until you were confirmed. And you were confirmed when you learned the catechism and approximately 14, 15 years old, something like that. So I had to go somewhere else to celebrate communion, and I guess it was one of the deacons uh, that was supplying for me, and I must have pre-consecrated some elements so they could pass them out. I don't remember exactly what the details were, but one young man in the congregation was dared by his friends go up and take communion without being confirmed. Now you know what happened. The people told on him, and the word came to me, and that so-and-so, let's call his name Johann Schmidt, comes to me and says, here's my son. He sneaked to communion and took communion without being confirmed. What are we going to do about this? I said, let me talk to this young man by himself. You go away, Pop. I'll take care of this. And I said to the young man, now you know that this is not something that is going to be an occasion for you to be condemned to hell forever and ever because you <coughs> broke the congregation's rules about taking communion. This is not a serious matter as far as theology is concerned. But what is serious is that you broke the congregation's rules. And rules are important because without rules we have chaos. We can't have chaos and learn anything. So we have to deal with this. I'm going to make the following suggestion to you, and you can say yes or no. I'm going to suggest that on Sunday, I'm going to call you forward 
and I'm going to ask you to face the congregation and say something like this to them. I broke the congregation's rules, and I am sorry for doing that. I promise not to do it again. And then you turn around and face me, you get down on your knees, and I pronounce an absolution. I forgive you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You stand up on your feet, you go back to your place, and that's the end of it. Or we do nothing and your father will give you a licking or whatever it is that he has in mind for you. What do you choose? He said, I'll, do, I'll take the first. I'll, I don't want my dad to have to get a switch after me, so I will come and I will confess to the people. And that's what he did. And that went beautifully. But I got it, the last word in. And I said, now I don't want to see any snickering in this church today. This man, this young man handled the situation well. He acted like an adult. He confessed his sin. He received absolution. He said he was sorry he received absolution. Some of you have done some terrible things in your private lives that have never confessed it and never done as well as this young man today, so you leave him alone. I didn't hear any more about the problem because people knew that I knew something that was going on that maybe they didn't know. There was one other thing that happened that I should tell you about while I have a little bit of time left. I think the Reverend Fathers in Halle had no real sense of the size of this country the distances between places. I don't think they had a proper understanding of this um, because I got a request from them to go down to Georgia and settle a fight between two pastors at Ebenezer Church in Georgia. Hebron Church, I think Hebron Church in Ebenezer is the name of the town. And of course you could not say no to the Hall of Fathers. I mean, they were holy men. You, you had to do whatever they asked of you, even if it was something that was nearly impossible. And I said to Mama, I, I don't know how to do this. This is going to be a, a terrible task. I'll be away from you for, and the children for. She said, no, you won't be away from me because I'm going with you. I said, oh, Mama, you don't want to go on this trip like this on a sloop. It's terrible. You'll be seasick the whole way down there, and uh, it'll, it'll just be an awful experience for you. No, she said, I'm going with you. Watch my lips. I am going with you. We'll get the neighbors to take care of the kids. All right. I don't, when she got into that mode, I knew better than to argue with her. And it was a rough trip down there, but boy, oh boy, oh boy, was I glad that she went with me because this was a messed up place. These people were at each other's throats and it was a typical situation of a young know-it-all straight from Germany criticizing everything that the old guy did. And they just were dividing the congregation. It was dreadful situation. And he had made some mistakes. The old guy had made some mistakes. And the young guy used the mistakes to lord it over the old guy. This was a unworkable situation. So I finally got them, I browbeat them both to forgive one another and to promise to cooperate and pray for one another and work together and left. There was no more that I could do. I don't know, they must have solved some of the problems because the congregation still exists. So that says something worked okay. I want to say one or two words about the Revolutionary War, and then I want to say uh, a word or two about post-Revolutionary War, and then we'll be done. I bought the house in Trap, the second house in Trap. And this was after we sold the parsonage and moved into Philly and worked into Philadelphia for quite a while. And then there were words of impending war. And I knew that they would be coming after me if the British ever occupied Philadelphia. 
I was the unofficial leader of the German speakers in southeastern Pennsylvania, and I had to get my family out of Philadelphia in order to keep them safe from a British occupation. If they put me and Mama on a prison ship, we might not survive that. So we bought the place in Trap, and you can go see the Muhlenberg House in Trap. That was where I spent my last years. At that time, I wasn't quite sure which side to support, either the American side or the British side. My sons were already on the American side, and they tried to uh, convince me, and uh, we were getting nowhere fast. And then something happened. Winter at Valley Forge. I watched those young men get sick. Some of them even die of pneumonia and uh, the other plagues that would come through the town from time to time. But they kept on marching. They were willing to die in their places. That's the kind of devotion you need if you're going to win a war. That was the one thing that almost made me change my mind. And then when the second thing happened, I came up down on the American side. We heard this loud sound in trap. We had no idea what it was. Nobody had heard anything like that before. And one or two of the family members that came out and would visit us weekly said, the Americans blew up a British munitions ship in the middle of the Delaware. And that's what you heard. Oh my goodness, if they are able to do that, they can win this war for sure. And I came down on the American side. I really didn't care which side won, to be honest with you. What I cared about was that my people would be on the winning side. That was what I struggled with. And now I thought for sure the Americans would win. Let's all get on the winning side right away. And then the last thing maybe that I want to say to you today is after the war was won, we were faced with another interesting challenge. A group of people came to me and said, we want you to support our project. We want to lobby and struggle for making the German language a legal language, an official language in Pennsylvania, so that all the documents and all the publications of the government would have to be printed in two languages, English and German. We want you to support this. I thought about that very carefully. And ultimately, I came down on the negative side. I said, no. I am not going to support this. This would make our English neighbors uncomfortable, and we should not be about trying to replicate a little German village or a German city in this country. We got a lot of things wrong in Europe. Now is a chance for us to get things right. No, we should learn English as quickly as possible, and we should view each other not as English speakers and as German speakers, but we should view each other as Pennsylvanians, as Americans. We are all one people now, and I should be able to live next door to you, whether you speak English or German, or whether you're Catholic or Lutheran or a Quaker, we should be able to live amongst each other without any more difficulties. Always supporting one another. We're taking on a new identity now. We have a chance in this country to get it right. Let's take that chance and go with it. And that's what we did. And I think I'll end it there. If there are any questions, I would be happy to uh, attempt to Answer them. May I take the microphone here, Dr. Are there any questions? I'm sure other people here are too.
too, but who's, whose statue is it on Muhlenberg's campus that I had to bow in front of and say that I was a poor and lowly freshman? You? I don't know what the question was. Oh, I love that. I love that question. First of all, that's not a statue of me. That's a statue of my son, Peter. of your son. Now, the question that I think is behind what you want to say is, does this really happen or not, or is this just a myth? My position is, yes, it did happen. But it may not be exactly what you think it was. This was not my son Peter all of a sudden filled with a uh, spirit of patriotism and he's ready to give his life for the country. No, this was a recruiting technique. How many Lutheran pastors do you know wear their military uniform underneath their vestments? No, that was all staged, but it worked. And it fired up the young men, and they needed the young men in the army. There was a whole German regiment. And if it works, go with it. But lots of times you hear that story put forth as if this was a, an emotional experience. And he was such a wonderful uh, uh, leader that uh, he had come prepared for taking off for the battlefield right away. No. That wasn't it. And there were other people that used the same technique. And we know that. We have records of that. So now you know what that statue is for. Somebody asked me, is there a statue of, of you? I went to Muhlenberg College. And I said, well, at, when I was there, there was no statue of Henry for whom the college is named. The college is named for Henry, not the man that's in the statue out on the front lawn. But um, I understand now that there is a statue of Henry inside, uh, in the old library, I think somebody said. I have yet to see that. I was in the first co-ed class at Muhlenberg. Up to my time, they were just men. And so I was the fir in the fir very first class where they allowed women to come for four years. And uh, we had freshmen, uh, you would call it hazing regulations is what they called it at the time. And uh, one of the things that I had to do was uh, bow in front of the statue, literally get down on my hands and knees and bow. Uh, an homage to that statue and the person who was pictured in that, depicted in that statue. So, and it was in the rain, no matter what weather I had to do it, because I was a lowly freshman and a woman at that. Are there other questions? Tom, I know that you're a interested in history and dove into Henry Melchior Muhlenberg's diaries. What motivated you to create a one-man play on his life? fought the idea tooth and nail. I knew it would be too much work. I was serving as a docent in the Muhlenberg House that I referred to earlier in my German remarks. And I was in Henry's office, and I had a five-minute spiel about what was in the room, uh, the artifacts that were in the room, and so forth and so on. And I happened to use the story of uh, falling in love with Anna Maria. And everybody 
enjoyed the presentation so much, there was a representative of the uh, Goshenhoppen historians. All the historical societies have been invited to see the new interior of the Muhlenberg House. And here, this delegation from the Goshenhoppen historians, the northern end of Montgomery County, there were a couple people there. Bill Daly, I think the guy's name was. Nice, nice guy. He says to me after the people left the room and he and I were left alone, he said, uh, you know, I like that presentation that you gave. I like it so much, I want you to turn it into an hour presentation uh, and do a program for us up in Green Lane at the um, uh, Redmond's Hall there in Green Lane. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. You people are real historians up there. I'm just playing games here. I happened to read the three volumes of the uh, Muhlenberg journals, and I enjoyed that very much. But uh, I'm not going to memorize that uh, an hour's worth of material just for you people up there. No, I'm not going to do it. And he would not take no for an answer. That man hung and cl clung to me like gorilla glue. Uh, and he wouldn't leave me until I said yes. And I said yes just to get rid of him. I had no intention of following on through. And then I started to think, now wait a minute, you wouldn't have to memorize everything. All you have to do is have in your memory a list of subjects. And you can just tell the story differently every time you do a program. It doesn't have to be the same. I left out a lot of stuff today. I could go on for another half an hour, but I'm not going to do that because I see your eyes even glazing over right now, so I, I don't want to do that. But when I made that discovery that, that I don't have to memorize anything, I can just proceed at my own interest. You don't know what interests me, I don't know what interests you, and we just see what gives. And there, I, I discovered that there is a hunger amongst our people, mainly our Lutheran people, about their heritage. They don't know squat about Gillenburg. And it's a story that's worth knowing. It really is a, a wonderful uh, uh, tale of getting people to think in a different way, a new way. And he has to do this himself. I mean, he was a very authoritarian figure when he arrived here. And he learned how to work with people and get people to uh, work together. And it wasn't so one general and everybody else are soldiers. And we had groups of people working together. That, that was a, a fascinating thing for me. Every Lutheran pastor has to learn how to do that one way or another if you're going to be a, a successful pastor in, in any setting whatsoever. So I just, I just went with the flow. <laughs> there are refreshments in the back, and um, if you would like to stay and have uh, conversations uh, with uh, Thomas Kokenderfer, uh, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, welcome, and uh, glad you were here. Hope you enjoyed it.